this video is hard to understand, you may want to turn on the closed captions if available, adjust the playback speed to slow down the video, consider watching short clips, then pause, listen, and watch again, or ask someone in your home to watch the video with you. Stop frequently and talk to your partner about what you heard and understood. My name is DJT Hicks and I teach 8th grade science and physical science at Cedar Bluff Middle School. The handout that accompanies this video can be found on the Knox County Schools website under the Student Resources tab. This is week 4, April the 27th activity packet. Today's activity is an 8th grade science lesson reviewing adaptations, variations, and natural selection. And if you need a printed copy of this activity, they're going to be given out at meal distribution sites on Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Let's go over some vocabulary we'll need for this lesson. Species, a group of similar organisms that can mate with each other and produce fertile offspring. Adaptation, trait that increases an organism's ability to survive and reproduce. Adaptations can be both structural or behavioral. Behavioral adaptations, things such as migration and hibernation that animals do seasonally, or just behaviors they do such as rolling up into a ball like an armadillo does or going into their shell like a turtle does as a defense mechanism as an adaptation behaviorally. Structural adaptations are things such as ibex ability to hop up on the sides of cliffs in very steep areas and be able to hold themselves up there in the hooves and the muscles they have to allow them to do that. Um, variations, these are any differences between individuals of the same species. I always use the example with my students of just look around the room. We're all humans. We're all exactly the same as far as our makeup, but then you weigh, you look at how we're made up. Some people have long hair. Some people have short hair. Some people have no hair. Um, some people have red hair, brown hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, green eyes, big noses, small noses, um, all sorts of different things that you can look at as variations. You can look at that when you walk into a flower shop or you walk into um, a pet store and you look at different animals of the same species that are vastly different. And then the last two are predator and prey and these are going to come into play as far as the activity that we're using today. And a predator is any animal or other organism that hunts and kills other organisms primarily for food. And then the last one is prey, an animal that is hunted and killed by another for food. This is Lithopodius nulla. A simple creature with a tendency, like any other species, to reproduce offspring. Lots of offspring. Although the offspring inherit many characteristics of their parents, no two individuals in the population are exactly the same. This variation is vital to the survival of the species, as only a fraction of the Lithopodius will actually survive long enough to reproduce themselves. As a result, only those with characteristics that are best suited for survival in the environment will pass on these successful traits to the next generation. Those with characteristics less suited to the environment are less likely to survive and reproduce. This process is called natural selection, and over time and generations, it leads to the build-up of favorable characteristics in the population of a species. The result is a transformation of a population over time to suit its environment. This is known as adaptation. Environmental pressures can also change. But as long as variation in a population exists, new adaptations can occur, ensuring the survival of the species. Now, as you can see in the video, those organisms that had traits that were more desirable and allowed them to better survive in the environment were the ones that continued to be able to reproduce and were not seen or captured by the predator from above. But as the environment changed, the traits that were more desirable changed in those organisms over time. Thus, those that were surviving continued to change and adapt over time, 
all the way to the end where the environment went from a desert type of climate or area to an area that was more of a lush green sort of environment and the green ones were the ones that were able to survive better. Thus illustrating the concept of natural selection which is the process by which individuals that are better adapted to their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce as opposed to other members of the same species. Sometimes we refer to this as survival of the fittest. Now you can think about this with an example of giraffes. For example, if you have giraffes that have a little bit longer neck than others, so you have long neck giraffes and short neck giraffes, as vegetation becomes more scarce, maybe because of drought or famine or just too many of the giraffes in the area, those that have the short necks only have a limited area in which they can eat as far as being able to get up in the trees and get more vegetation. But those with the longer necks can continue to eat even after that drought or famine has begun and thus they're going to be healthier and have a higher chance to reproduce more successfully, thus having a higher chance of passing along their trait of longer necks in the giraffes. So over time, those giraffes in that given area are going to have longer necks. The same can be seen with birds based on where they live and where they get their food and how they get their food. When you think about birds that may live in a more grassy area and are trying to get food or insects from inside the ground, inside the dirt, they're probably going to have longer pointier beaks that are able to cut through the dirt and get into the ground and be able to kind of get their way through the grass. Whereas those that live in a rockier area and that are getting either uh, nuts or shells or insects off of rockier areas, a long narrow beak will probably crack and break as they try to do that along the rocks whereas they are going to more likely have a shorter, stubbier beak that will be able to withstand that pounding. As we talk about natural selection, there are three factors that really influence natural selection, and they all kind of play a part with each other, but the first one is overproduction or overpopulation, meaning more mem members will be born within a species than will live to become adults. Next, there's variation. Individuals have differences, like we spoke of earlier. As you look around the people in your life and how, while you may even be from the same family, you have a lot of different variations with how things are manifested physically. When you think back to seventh grade science and think about genotype versus phenotype, all right, the phenotype of each individual is different, even though some of the genetic makeup may be very, very similar. And some of these help individuals to survive better. In the video from the previous slide, you saw where those who were had the coloration or the pattern of the environment around them were able to survive and kind of camouflage themselves away from the predator. And then the last aspect that we're worried about with natural selection is competition. This is what we call kind of the struggle to survive, meaning resources may become scarce, whether it be finding a mate or even avoiding predators. All of these things, the competition, and this is what we think of a lot of times when we think of survival of the fittest, is the fact that organisms are competing each, against each other for certain things. They're competing for a mate to be able to pass along their traits and reproduce and think about different animals and other organisms that have courtship dances, whether it be birds or other things or different courtship rituals. Um, same thing, trying to avoid predators like we saw in the video. Finding resources, whether it be an area to nest or raise their young or just to be able to get um, food and water and other sources, resources like that. Another aspect of natural selection is population bottleneck, or oftentimes referred to as genetic bottleneck. And what this is, is a sharp reduction in the size of a population due to some sort of event. Now these events can be environmental, such as fire, disease, drought, famine, natural disasters, or they can be caused by humans, such as destruction of habitat for either commercial or industrial reasons, or the introduction of non-native species to an area. So what happens is, you have a diverse amount of variations within a population. And so what then happens is this diversity within these variations allows them to be the same, but slightly different. Just as you look as humans in your life, they're all slightly different and there's different variations within, within the way they look and even within the way they act. But then what it leads to is, for example, um, the flu each year. Each year, many people get the flu vaccine through a shot or the flu mist. And what happens is, that flu vaccine is based off the previous year's strain of the flu. And so what they're trying to do is make sure people don't get sick from that same strain of the flu the next year. So what happens is by getting that flu vaccine, many people are able to fight off the flu from the previous year and in that year as well. But what happens is as that flu begins to adapt and the different variations of that strain of flu 
that go around throughout the flu season, those strains of the flu are the ones that start getting people sick. So that genetic bottleneck in this case is the fact of when that vaccine is developed and people start to get the flu vaccine, that's your genetic bottleneck that starts killing off a lot of those different flu viruses. And then as those other ones that have the traits that help them to be able to better survive in this new environment, those viruses are able to be the ones that survive. They get people sick or they get into people and they lay dormant until the next flu season. And so then on the other side, you're going to see a higher prevalence of those that were able to survive that vaccine. The same can be said of many different organisms, plant, animal, even humans. We're kind of seeing that situation right now as many scientists and healthcare professionals around the world are trying to search for a vaccine or cure or something to just lessen the symptoms from the current COVID-19 pandemic. Now for the activity. First thing you need to do is get eight different colored pieces of paper, be it construction paper, cardstock, whatever. If you don't have eight different colored pieces of paper, you can always color them using markers, crayons, colored pencils, etc., whatever works. Uh, preferably the colors should be black, blue, brown, green, orange, red, purple, and yellow. Next, you're going to take those larger pieces of paper and cut them into thin strips. The thinner the better, but not too thin. And you don't have to use the entire sheet of paper since you're just doing it for one individual, but I use an area approximately the size of 16 centimeters by 12 centimeters to cut my thin strips. After you've cut them into thin strips, you're going to cut those thin strips into very small pieces, almost the size of confetti. You want them to be small, but not too extremely small. Obviously, you need to do this in an area that's easy to clean up or that you can quickly sweep up or vacuum up. I did mine on the counter and I did it over a plastic cup and put all of my pieces in there. Now you want to find an area outside where you can throw the pieces of paper. This can be your yard, a field, or grassy area near where you live. As long as it's somewhere that you have permission to throw these pieces of paper and it's safe as well. If you don't have an area outside to throw the pieces of paper, I've included a 30 second video of the field where I threw mine that you can use to count for your data table. My suggestion, if you do use the video, is to run the video a total of four times and each time count only two different colors as you go through the video to record in your data table. Now that you've found that field or grassy area, come up with an approximate area. I used about nine and a half feet by seven and a half feet based on the fact that I did not use the entire piece of paper for each color. And uh, what you're going to do is just throw these pieces of paper in the air and just let them land on their own. Once you do that, you don't want to notice where specific colors have landed, but do make sure that there aren't bunches or clumps of pieces of paper near each other. Now, before you begin searching for the pieces of paper, think about this in our activity. The pieces of paper on the ground are like prey that is trying to stay away from or not be caught by the predator, whereas the people searching for them are going to play the role of the predator in this activity. So, as we search for the pieces of paper, some are going to stick out a whole lot more and be found a lot more easily because they're not as well suited or adapted to their environment, while others, because of the variations in their color, are going to blend in a lot better and are better adapted and suited to their environment, thus they will survive a little bit better. As you do this, you're going to take approximately 45 seconds to search for pieces of paper. You'll pick them up one piece at a time and put them in your other hand. Once your 45 seconds is up, you'll take all of those collect them into a cup, a plastic bag or whatever, take them inside to count and record in your data table. If you're using the video at the end of this because you don't have a grassy area, you will follow those rules of playing it approximately four times and searching for two colors each time and recording that information into your data table. In closing, remember that natural selection is a process by which individuals that are better suited to an environment are more likely to survive, thus making them healthier and more able to reproduce and have successful and healthy offspring that carry on the traits of the parent offspring. Remember those factors that affect natural selection, overpopulation or having too many in a given area that then creates competition for food, resources, mates, etc. And as well, variation within the species is oftentimes what allows certain individuals to be better suited to their environment. So overpopulation, variation, and competition. And also, the population bottleneck, which is that event 
that causes a sharp reduction in the size of a population, and only those with the traits better suited or best suited to the environment are going to be the ones that are going to survive on the other side of that genetic bottleneck. In closing, I hope that this has been somewhat informative to you, and I hope all of you are staying safe, healthy, and trying to stay sane during these unprecedented times. Also, if you had the grassy area in which to do the activity, this is the end of the video for you. But if you didn't have that grassy area and you need the video which I provided for you to be able to search for the pieces of paper, continue to hang on and it'll come next after this.